you're syncing up and tuning in to the Lending Link Podcast, powered by GDS Link, where the modern day lender can dive deeper into the future of data, decisioning, and credit risk solutions. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm your host, Rich Altman, and today we're syncing up with Cambridge Wilkinson's Tom McDermott. Tom is a managing director with Cambridge Wilkinson, a New York City-based investment banking firm that arranges debt and equity capital for their operating company clients with top family offices, insurance companies, pension funds, endowment funds, private credit funds, private equity groups, and other capital providers. Tom has been with Cambridge Wilkinson for seven years and is a global operating executive and advisor focused on financial services, including lending and payments, consumer products and services, aerospace, technology, and the environment, sustainability, and governance industries. Tom joined Cambridge Wilkinson with over 30 years of diverse operating experience across a broad spectrum of industries, including financial services, technology, and consumer product companies. Tom is also the founder of Money Access Financial and Advisory Business to CEOs, focused on innovative strategy, execution, and capital raising. Tom holds a Bachelor of Science from Boston College. In this episode, Tom and I will touch on many facets of the investment industry, including some key terms, the role of an investment banker, key market trends, and so much more. But before we dive into the interview, please head over to our LinkedIn and Twitter pages at GDS Link, that's G-D-S-L-I-N-K, and hit those like and follow buttons. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you prefer to listen to your podcast. All right now, let's get synced with GDS Link. Good afternoon, Tom. How are we doing? Doing good, Rich. Absolutely. Good. I hope you're having a productive week so far. So where are you joining me from today? So I'm calling you from my home office in Allendale, New Jersey. That's located in Bergen County, about uh, 25 miles due west of Manhattan. Great. Well, we really appreciate your uh, joining us this afternoon. So, Tom, you've been with uh, Cambridge now for about seven years. Maybe you can share a little bit more about your background before starting with Cambridge Wilkinson. Yeah, thanks, Rich. So I've had a very fortunate career. Really, the first 30 years of my career has been that as an operator in various industries. The first 15 years of those 30 were spent in consumer packaged goods. So what does that mean? Nabisco, Unilever, Reckitt. And I had the good fortune to spend eight of those years in Europe and Latin America driving those businesses. And then I pivoted into technology and financial services. So I worked at the big companies that you may recognize, First Data Corporation, Western Union, Capital One, as well as some earlier stage businesses. That was good for me because those were either venture capital backed or PE backed early stage businesses. And you got to know your way around raising capital as an operator. And then after that, I joined Cambridge Wilkinson. That's now seven years ago. I have a strong focus in financial services and fintech and specialty finance. I also manage the ESG practice and have a lot of interest in the consumer products as well as technology. Thanks for sharing, Tom. Quite a background. So uh, before we dive into business, let's get a little personal. You and I were chatting in preparation for today's session, and you mentioned that you had done some work in South Africa. Um, As you know, I've spent some time there as well, quite a long trip to get down there. But you shared a pretty interesting uh, situation that happened on uh, a trip that maybe becomes uh, etched in your mind as one that you'll never forget. So maybe you could share what happened with us. Yeah, happy to do that, Rich. Yeah, this is one of those trips that you will never forget for sure. So I was living in London and we had to do a travel to Johannesburg in South Africa. And if you look at a map, it's basically 12 hours due south in a plane, not very complicated. And so halfway over in our journey, as we're about halfway over Africa, one of the passengers had a medical emergency and they really didn't have a plan what to do over Africa. So they turned around and spent another three hours, four hours heading back. We ended up in a small island in Spain, and we had complications there because (laughs) Spain does not accept South Africans without a visa. So that was very difficult to get people on the tarmac. Long story short, 18 hours after we had left from London, we returned to London. Wow. And as we exited the, uh, the aircraft, we were invited to the Virgin Club, which, and if you've been to... Heathrow. It's a really tremendous infrastructure. And there we see Sir Richard Branson standing there in his stocking feet, because of course he had his boots being shined at the shining place, uh, hand, uh, standing there with a glass of virgin cola and uh, called all the 
the passenger's over and basically said, blame me. This is uh, poor planning. We messed it up. We're going to get it right. We're going to get a new uh, aircraft, a whole new crew. We're going to get you out of here in a couple hours, and we're going to get you down to Johannesburg as fast as you can. So he did that, and we ended up arriving 36 hours after we originally left. And it's a great example of how a marketing wizard can turn lemons into lemonade. I mean, it, it's right. just, here I am, 30 some odd years later, telling the story about how a good consumer brand manager this guy is. Yeah, it's, I think I read about another situation with him or something happened as well. And he was there as people were coming off the plane. Hopefully the woman that or the person had the uh, problems on the plane was OK. And hopefully you got all those points for all the different uh MQMs uh, flying around on on uh, their airline. So, uh, you know, thanks for that. And But, you know, let's get down to business. So, to, you know, to be really tru truly knowledgeable in the investment world, there are a lot of terms to become familiar with and to understand their importance in the sector of our economy. Um, clearly, we can't cover all of them in a 45-minute podcast. And besides, there's great access to things like Investopedia that has really good information and content on the space. And, of course, now you can just log on and ask ChatGPT to, you know, write you a research paper. So that said, I thought it would be good to start off by going over a few terms of interest that really come into play in the industries that you operate. First, uh, why don't we start off with what is a definition of an investment banking firm and perhaps share a month in the life of Tom McDermott? Investment banking is a very, very broad term. You know, at a very high level, investment banks provide financial services to corporations, to institutional clients. We're talking about the investing side, raising capital. And we all hear about M&A and, and, and managing an M&A process. Effectively, you're dealing with the public markets, you're dealing with the private markets. And at the end of the day, investment bankers are, are intermediaries, essentially with the objective of matching parties, of matching, in this case, the client who may be seeking capital and the investor who's looking to deploy it in a way that's consistent with the one who wants to get invested in. So at a high level, we see thousands and thousands. There's big firms, small firms. I would say ours is on, a, on the smaller side. And let me spend a couple of minutes to talk about, you know, what is the month in the life of, of what I do in investment banking? And so first at a high level, just to explain, I focus on in the firm, we focus on raising capital for what we call middle market, lower middle market company. What does that mean? That means typically a company with revenue somewhere between 10 million and 500 million. In our case, it's, it's mostly raising capital. We do M&A as well, but the vast majority of what we do is raise capital. That's, you know, for us, that's 25 million and up into the hundreds of millions. And we've got a, a few mandates uh, in the billions as well. And so we work in a variety of industries. As I mentioned earlier, financial services is a big part of it, but we're, you know, I've got, uh, you know, fingers, if you will, in a lot of different industries. And so what do we do? We really, and this is why I, I like what I do, we do everything from my goal, cradle to grave. So what does that mean? In terms of identifying prospect customers, part of our job is to go out and find companies that fit a sector that we think our investor base will have interest. We go out and contact them. We work with them. We understand their needs. And if we're successfully understanding it and they like what we do, we'll get engaged with them, meaning that they'll hire us and retain us to go out and raise their capital, whatever that might be, you know, find a partner to acquire or sell themselves if that's the case. And then you've got the process of the raising the capital. So we've got hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, investors. And what you want to do is you really want to match the right investor with the right investment opportunity. And so we'll manage that whole process. We'll work with them until they get term sheets. Once they get term sheets, we'll go through what's called a due diligence process and all the way to what we call the closing process. And um, you know our, our goal is to make sure it's a great outcome for both parties because uh, they're going to be working together a long time together uh, with with that investment mandate. So that's a little bit about a day in the life. So when we think about sources of capital, and we talked about this at the very beginning when I was introducing your firm, family offices, private equity firms, and venture capital firms are some sources of capital that you look to bring to your mutual customers. Can you briefly talk about what is a family office? It's a term that we hear a lot in the investment community. And as well, what is the key differences between a private equity firm and a venture capital firm? Let me start with the family office side. Family offices can be very small, $5, $10 million in assets under management, all the way up to, I mean, we, one of our largest multifamily offices is $400 billion in assets under management. 
We're typically what we would call institutional. So most of our family offices will start at, I'm going to say, a half a billion dollars in assets under management and all the way on up. Some of them are what we call single family office. Others are multifamily. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. But what I think what, what's interesting about family offices when we will compare to private equity firms and other types of investors, family offices are very different. Since it's a capital set that's in from one family or maybe two, there's not a lot of what we call LPs or people who have to decide or give guidelines. So we find that family offices tend to have a longer investment horizon. We call that patient equity. Because it's their own money and it's one pot of money, they tend to be more flexible about the structure of the deal. Is it equity? Is it junior debt? Is it senior debt? They can work in all sectors if they want to. And so as a result, I may bring a deal. And I'll remember early in my uh, career at, at Cambridge Wilkinson, I, I asked a family office, you know, we've got this opportunity for a good equity investment. You know, what would be your idea of, of exiting this and cashing out? He says, well, we're typically buying and, and investing in companies for generations. So probably the grandkids of the current owner of the, the, the family office would be maybe wanting to sell at that point. And, and it's not hyperbole. That's very different. And I'll move now into private equity firms. Private equity firms are backed by, in general, by what we call limited partners, LPs. They can be pension funds, insurance companies, endowments, other types of asset managers. And when a private equity firm goes out and raises money, they have a thesis. They pretty much have say over this, we're going to invest in these type of assets. We expect this type of return and we expect this type of duration. Yeah, typical duration, five years, seven years. So when a private equity firm is investing, they want to make sure they're satisfying their goals, which has been agreed to by the LP. So they can't change the rules halfway through the game and say, oh, wow, why don't we do something very different? Well, they've got to go back to their LPs <laughs> and get their agreement if that's the case. So the, the private equity guys are bound by um, some, some uh, guidelines, if you will, for each of the funds that they have. And these private equity funds may have three funds. We have some we see, you know, 15 funds with different pockets of capital and different needs that they want to fill. So at a high level, that's the different, that's that's a private equity firm. Now, venture capital is another bucket of of investors and venture capital guys like the early stage stuff. They are big believers in coming in when there's high risk. When they the company may have a minor pilot program, they may have a great team, but they haven't really figured out or haven't arrived at being profitable. They may know how we're going to get the profitability, mm -hmm. but they're probably losing money. And so venture capital guys invest and their view is if I invest in 10 companies, Maybe three will be very successful and hit you know a 10 time return or more. Maybe one or two will break even, and then the balance will fall off and and not have any returns. Mm -hmm. So that's a very different profile. The private equity guys really need to make money on all their deals. They're going to look for businesses that have a sustainable cash flow, and they're looking to increase the growth targets and the margins. So the very different buckets of capital and VC. It's symbiotic. You know, VCs if they're good at what they do, they'll invest help the company grow. And at that, you know, when they get to a, a larger stage, that's when the private equity and the growth equity guys come in. So we go from patient funding to very impatient funding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Although that doesn't mean that the you know, family offices don't have their expectations. Well, thanks. Uh, so one of the things I see on a lot of your tablets where you talk about the success of the deals that you've done is a term senior secured debt facility. Maybe you could just quickly talk about what that actually is. We're going to talk about the capital stack and the capital stack is, you know, when you use that term, that means, you know, there's debt, there's junior debt. We'll talk about that. There's equity. Senior debt is the safest. It's the it's the safest money in the corporate, if you will, the capital stack. It's secured by assets. You can have a senior senior debt at the corporate level. When you ask specifically about senior secured debt facility, that's frequently used by companies who have specific assets that they want to borrow against. The most common is what we see is, is a pool of, uh, of loans out to consumers or small businesses, mortgages, real estate investments. And so, as I said, it's the most secure part of the capital stack. And what the implication is, is that the return on that capital is lower than the other elements of the capital stack. So relatively speaking, it'll be a lower return because it's a lower risk. And you'll hear a lot about what's the risk and return profile. This is where you want to be in the senior debt investor typically is looking for low risk and not necessarily low return, but something that is 
that is um, commensurate with the level of risk they take. So another term that you hear a lot in the space is something called mezzanine finance. For most people that aren't involved with the investment community, they hear mezzanine and they think about going for a Broadway show and getting that mezzanine level, which is typically, a, if you're out in front, it's a pretty expensive level to be on. Where does mezzanine financing come into play and, and what exactly is it in the world that you live in? Yeah. So I suspect it did come from, as you said, the theater where you're sitting in the second level and the people on the first level are the senior debt guys and they have first access and you're sitting in the mezzanine mean you have second access. And that's an oversimplification of what we're talking about here. Mezzanine debt, which is also called junior debt, it's called subordinate debt, falls below the senior. And so that means there's higher risk. So if something goes wrong in the company and there's some liquidation that takes place, the folks who are at the senior, they get their money first and they walk away. And when all those senior lenders are satisfied, then the mezzanine folks are standing in line behind them and they get their money next. So it's typically going to be a higher risk and therefore will be a higher return. The cost of capital will be higher. In some cases, it's not just in terms of an interest rate. Sometimes it's also paid in the form of warrants or you know pieces of the equity over time. And at the end of the day, you have investors who like both. And it's a question of their appetite for risk and return and, and how they think they can manage that. Now, I came across a term when I was doing a little research on mezzanine financing, something called the haircut money. What is haircut money? Yeah. So haircut money, it's a very industry specific term that's used typically in specialty finance. And what haircut money is, is the mezzanine piece in the corporate structure of a loan facility. So using some of the terms we've already discussed, a senior lender will come in and when they are taking a position against a pool of loans, and, and I'll get to what some of those other assets can be, but when they're looking at those pool of loans, typically that senior lender will come in and say, I'll pay you the first, I'm gonna make this up as an example, I'll pay you 65 cents for every dollar of loans or assets that you have in that pool. And so the owner of the business is left with the task to come up with another 35 cents for every dollar. And if you're right. raising equity, that really sucks up a lot of your equity right. and may not be a good use of that equity funds. They want to use it to hire the people and grow the business and spend on marketing. So therefore, the lender will go out and find a mezzanine financer who will sit under that senior debt and bring in, and I'm using the same example, maybe they'll bring in 25 or 30 of the next points. So instead right. of going to 65, they can get to say 90%. And they'll so they'll take that slug of 25% risk. They'll charge for it. It'll be a higher cost of capital. But the lender, the operator, doesn't need to come up with 35 cents for every dollar lent. It's only 10 cents. Mm -hmm. And so thus, I'm not sure how it came about, but <laughs> it, the haircut money is very frequently, you'll be in a meeting and they'll say, great, that's a great senior debt facility you have, but how are you going to pay? Where's your haircut? What, what do you right. got? Well, I'm getting my haircut on Thursday, so it's going to have a whole new meaning to me. Uh, so thanks, Tom, for the quick uh, classroom and going over some of the key terms in the investment banking world. So let's kind of jump from the classroom and into the market. You mentioned specialty finance. We know that's one of your areas of focus and a big focus for Cambridge Wilkinson. Can you kind of touch on what really falls under that umbrella of specialty finance and give us an example of a company without mentioning their name, if you don't want to, about a, a deal that you might have worked on. Sure, absolutely. So at a high level, again, what is specialty finance? It's financing activity that falls traditionally outside the traditional banking system. And generally speaking, there's two big sub sectors. One is consumer finance. The other is commercial finance. Think of it as like as a lending secured by financial or other hard assets and then earning an investment that's earned tied to those the performance of those assets. So to be a little bit more specific, there's a lot of folks probably listening in here who are with companies that are lenders. And these lenders are creating their own senior debt facilities or selling it on a forward flow basis, whatever the case may be, in order to build their business. And so that's specialty financing to finance a loan book. And so consumer lending is, is a big piece, could be credit cards, it could be point of sale installment lending, it could be uh, all sorts of, of consumer loans, secured in, it could be secured loans with cars, it could be secured loans with mortgages, but that's just part of it. You know, real estate is a huge part of this sector, but you may be familiar with the term fix and flippers. These yep. are construction operators who go around and they buy 
houses, they fix them up and flip them. And um, it's a it's an it's a big industry, and there's a lot of capital that's needed to support that industry. What's interesting is, and specialty finance is a lot of what I call esoteric assets, things that you may not even think about that people can use as collateral or as assets. So that litigation financing, there's a lot of firms that go out and buy cases that aren't maybe either fully litigated or have been litigated, but haven't been paid out yet. They'll buy those mm -hmm. and work out a deal. Intellectual property, there's life settlements where people buy the insurance, life insurance policies and calculate what they think they can make or not make uh, on, on buying them early or late. Another new one is music rights. So you may have been right. seeing in the news lately, people like Justin Bieber and Dr. Dre are selling their music rights. And that's one thing, I'm not referring to that business, but a lot of the buyers of that music will then go out and finance it by getting specialty finance financing against that book of music. And those are revenue streams that come in over time and they're basically putting a value on that. And they have to be certain that those value streams will continue over 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Yeah. And so they're, it's a really interesting industry. I'm a little biased. I just saw the Eagles for the uh, seventh time in my life and played in uh, Knoxville. And I wonder whether any of these new artists out there will have the sustaining power of companies or groups like the Eagles. Time will tell. Those, those yeah, guys will tell. <laughs> So, uh, Tom, I recently came across an article published by Price Waterhouse uh, that spoke to the fact that following a period of unprecedented activity from late 2020 through mid 2022, there was a measurable slowdown in private equity activity in the second half of 2022, reflecting uncertainty and disruption driven by inflation, rising interest rates, shuttered debt markets, and geopolitical turmoil. The article went on to say that over this period, private equity deal volume was down by 22% versus 12 months earlier. And it also stated that right now, the U.S. private equity firms are sitting on top of $1.1 trillion in idle investment cash, also referred to as dry powder. Couple this with the fact that we are speaking less than six weeks since the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. So as you and your firm look at 2023 and maybe even start thinking about 2024, what is your view and what are you seeing on the level of activity going on for the rest of the year as you kind of think about your forecast? I mean, this is a milestone year, 2023, for sure. And I wish I had a crystal ball that I could uh, you know, predict that one. If I did, I'd probably be down on Wall Street or retired by now. <laughs> but let me tell you what I do know and what we all know, right? Number one is we're seeing that investors are sitting on mountains of capital and they're sitting on the sidelines aching to put that money to work. And this is very different from 2008, 2009, where there wasn't liquidity. Here there is liquidity. But the issue is, where do the investors want to put their money to work? So you've got private equity. You just talked about the amount of dry powder. We call that dry powder that they have. We're seeing the same thing in the private credit markets and the multi-strat markets that they need capital to put to work. But now with everything going on, they're nervous. So what are they nervous about? Well, let me talk about at least the three things that are within the U.S. from a macroeconomic standpoint. And they're all interrelated, of course. The first, of course, is inflation. And we're seeing some positive steps in inflation. The Fed has put out a very aggressive goal of a 2% inflation over time. And as a result of that, to manage it, the Fed is increasing its rates. And there's another meeting in May. We're going to see if that goes up. There's uh, probably 50-50 money that it will go up or not. I think it'll depend on some of the numbers that come out in the next few weeks. But we're seeing it, we're in a position of rising in, in, in interest rates. And that has an adverse effects on operators, on companies, small businesses, medium size, and, and the larger ones, not so much because they have access to capital that they probably can get at a, at a more reasonable rate. But the small businesses and medium size don't. And we're, you know, I can just tell you from my own experience, clients were borrowing money at 7% last year, 6%, 8%. And that same company with the same level of risk and success will have to borrow that money at 12, 13, 14, 15%. And if you just do the math, that's a lot of interest to pay. And so it affects their ability to grow their business and, and an operator. So that impacts the third factor that everyone's worried about, and that's recession. So if a lot of the small businesses pull back, consumers do as well because their rates on their credit cards seem high, then that will minimize consumption and that can turn into a recession. And I think... Uh, in the last couple of weeks, most people are predicting some sort of a recession. And, and all those three factors combined 
just make investors more cautious. And you know, I'm a big believer from my experience in the markets, as soon as there is confidence of what's going to happen, doesn't mean whether it's good or bad, but as long as investors feel like they know what's going to happen, then they can place their bets and put their money in projects are going to say, I think this is going to happen. Therefore, I underwrote this against a certain environment, but today they can't because there's too many things may happen. And so to get to your question, what's going to happen? I mean, we, we see SVB and, and Signature. That was a surprise, I think, in the we look back on this, so they were probably one-offs, and there were probably some micro problems at that level, not necessarily at a whole economic level, but either way, it spooked a lot of people. And that resulted in people pulling back and being cautious. So, you know, you get to the question about the recovery. As I said, I think the recovery will come about when investors feel more certain about what's going to happen. I know that's a vague answer, but I find that's when you start to see things happen. And then in terms of the, the $64,000 question, well, when will this happen? Because I'd like to know so I can place my own bets. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Is it going to be mid-23? That's the earliest. But I think it's probably more likely next year. Maybe the, you know, we may see some green sprouts coming up the end of this year, but this can go into 24. And there's some people say it's going to, you know, we're going to see a melee's in the in the economy until 2025. Certainly, the election will have a big impact on that. We think about Silicon Valley Bank. You know, we we all went through that couple of days and just how quickly that accelerated. You know, the bank was uh, basically closed down on March 10th. This whole thing kind of started on March 8th. So here we are sitting March 13th, and it kind of reminded me of uh, if you've ever seen the movie with Kevin Costner called Draft Day, and he's in negotiation with this one guy, and they come up with a structure at one point in time in the call. And then five minutes later, they're talking again. And Kevin Costner wants more money. And the guy says, we just spoke five minutes ago. And he's like, yeah, but that was a lifetime ago, right? Five minutes. <laughs> um, and that's kind of what happened on with Silicon Valley Bank. You know, we were all sitting here on uh, the following Monday, like what just happened. And you talked about some of it as a lot of those companies were seeing their loan costs go up. They had to start pulling money out to pay those loans that reduced deposits. So it almost became a self-fulfilling prophecy to a certain extent. So Tom, we talked about equity, we talked about debt. And when you think about the deals that you've done so far in your career, if we think about what percent will debt be used versus equity? And you know, you mentioned a little earlier, people don't want to be giving up equity in their company if they could avoid it. But at some point, I guess they don't have a choice. So where do kind of like debt and equity fall into the percent mix of a deal? And are there some economic factors that would impact that, like some of the things we just talked about? It depends on a lot of, of a lot of circumstances. And when we think at a very high level of a broad transaction, someone is buying a company, as we probably all well know, the acquirer comes in with equity and it could be 30%, it could be 50%, depending on various factors. And then the balance, they typically borrow from it or they borrow from the seller of the company and they take notes from that uh, seller. So at a high level, generally speaking, you're always going to see more debt than equity in terms of dollar values. From a, a view of transactions, what I see, we tend to be more of a, of a debt shop, and that's for legacy reasons and probably some for certain relationships. And where we've gone out and raised debt, we sometimes see situations where the credit investor will like the deal and in fact like the company so much they're like well you know what i'm going to do the debt deal that we're we're talking about but i'd like to sprinkle in some of my money in the equity doesn't mean they want to run the company and have enough investment in the equity to have a control situation but enough to participate in the upsides what they see on how the the, the company is going to do so we did that not too long ago with a payments company down in florida where we raised a, a good deal amount of debt and the investor said let's do some equity as well Another example in a completely different industry, we talk about ESG. I call the the we had a client focus more on the E of ESG, the environmental being renewables, and I'll get to it later, but in various sectors. And as we started to raise equity for them, and they just said, we're it's kind of a specialty finance investor. They said, we need mountains of capital. So yeah, we need tons of debt, which was the original ask, if you will. But along the way, they said, I probably need some mezzanine financing as well and a slug of equity capital as well to run the business. And we ended up bringing in one investor who brought in $265 million for the whole proverbial capital stack. So they brought in the equity, they brought in the senior debt, and they brought in the mezzanine. And you know, our client, they really checked a lot of boxes. Typically, you may have to go out and do three different 
transactions or deal with three different groups. And so that, quote unquote, simplified their life and enabled them to move quickly to fund the business. And the company's doing quite well now. So hopefully that answers the question. When we think about time frame, from the time that you first start transacting with a, co a company to getting a deal done, what's a typical time? Is it within three months? Is it a year and a half? Again, that's going to vary. But we're, as a firm, we're geared to move quickly. If you go to our website, you see the word speed matters. Scream yes. out. <laughs> so we're geared to get this in, in, in 90 days from the time we go to market with our clients, ask, if you will, to the time when the capital is put into our client's account. That's what we got into. We've moved quickly. I know we closed a $200 million deal like in 29 days because we had wow. to. <laughs> and sometimes deals drag on for you know the investor or the client. And you know I've seen things that take many more months than just three. So for startup companies that are looking at the capital raise process, successful, it could take them through many investment stages, right? Including investments from individuals, uh, friends and family, angel investing, seed rounds, growth round with multiple series, cross over culminating initial public offering, and then late stage resulting in a typical buyout. So when we think about Cambridge, where do you kind of focus on that time horizon? And can you share why you've decided to focus on that? Sure. So what we don't do is the early, the really early and what we call pre-revenue stuff. So with the VC-like deals, when a company is, they haven't proven themselves, they may have a great product, great idea, great team, but that's for venture capital. It doesn't mean it's not right for anybody to invest in. Our investors are not VC-like investors. Mm -hmm. the, our equity and other investors typically like to start what we call growth equity. So when the company already has established itself, they've gone out, they've raised equity, usually institutionally. They have a proven model that has a path to profitability. And they are now seeking capital simply to scale it. They say, we know what it is. This is how it runs. We just need to put gas in the engine. Right. To prove it. So that's that's growth equity. And we get involved a lot of that. I don't want to complicate things too much, but it tends to be a minority investor. In other words, someone who puts money into the company but doesn't control it. And that allows the management team to still have control at that stage of their growth. They, they prefer to have growth rather than giving, prefer to have control, I should say, rather than giving that away. That would be... A stage where we get started. And then with our private equity and our family offices, we go all the way through continuing to grow the company. And when it's time to sell, we can help establish an M&A process. We're not an IPO group. I mean, that's another type of investment bank. Uh, someday we may do that. But as for now, we're not an IPO shop. So we, we manage that whole spectrum from uh, when you're ready to when you've established it, you're growing. And you need capital until the end of the final stages of the company. So I know you've done a lot of work with non-prime or subprime lenders to help them raise capital. And what I was thinking is at a high level, when even some of the audience is probably listening today, maybe if you kind of think about from a checklist perspective, you know, what are the things that you would look for when you're evaluating companies that you want to represent and help them go out and grow and raise capital? I do get faced with a lot of non-prime lenders, very sophisticated, very strong and very profitable. And I love those businesses. So I've developed, I think, kind of like my four factors, which frankly, you could use those same factors when you look at other types of lenders. But my list is, I, I always start with number one, the management team. Does the management team have the experience, the track record to perform in this market? All these markets are very, very competitive. So being good may not be good enough. You have to really be great and leading a company through change. These are going to be various stages of growth. That's number one. The, the second is the model. You really got to have a proven model, proven in the, in the sense of the numbers prove it, ideally something that is proprietary or, or different enough in the marketplace where no one can easily copy. And part of that is the underwriting. So if you're doing assets, if you're a non-prime lender, you want to have at least 24 months of data to mm -hmm. demonstrate that you understand the trends, the charge-offs, defaults, and all that, all that good stuff. The third bucket is profitable model. And you know, I, I say this explicitly because many companies have a great product, they have a great proven scale, proven business. And but when you look at where's the profits, they're like, well, that we'll worry about that later. You really got to make <laughs> sure you've got a path to profitability of significant enough of margins. So when something goes wrong, you've got some room to work within that. So profitable business model where you've got you know, net, net interest margins and your cost of customer acquisition all lined up in that. And then lastly is your balance sheet. 
even though they're borrowing money to help their balance sheet, they have to have a good balance sheet now. Typically, when I talk with a company, I'll want to understand how much capital they have, how much cash they have on hand today, and what their monthly burn is. And you really want to calculate how many months of cash do they have before they run out. And it's important that they have many months on hand because these processes can be very circuitous and not always straight line as people hope. So you want to make sure that the clients have enough capital to sustain a proper capital raise. Good uh, takeaway and hopefully something that people on the phone on the uh, podcast or listening to the podcast today could take advantage of. So Tom, you've mentioned ESG a couple of times. We, we mentioned at the beginning, it stands for environmental, social, and governance. So I'm pretty convinced if I surveyed 100 people and said, what does the E and ESG stand for? I think they've heard enough about it that they're going to say, oh, that's environmental. But if I ask them what the S and the G stand for, I'm not so sure many people would know. So given it's a big focus of yours personally, as well as uh, the company, maybe you can talk a little bit about the S and the G in ESG and what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll start with the social standpoint. And, and that's what we're talking human rights and equity. So what is the organization's relationship with its employees, with its stakeholders? By way of example, we all remember back in the years uh, in Bangladesh, there were a lot of sport, sporting shoes and sporting goods companies that had operations in Bangladesh, and the workers were uh, working in very, very difficult work environments. Mm -hmm. And so that would be something that from a social standpoint, do your, are your, not just your employees, but in those cases, those would be stakeholders, third-party outsourced vendors. Are they being treated properly? So that, you know, that and that social covers a lot of things about equity too, across the employee base, but as well as the customer and their whole stakeholders. So that's a little bit about social. Talk about governance. It's more about hard issues. And that could be really focusing on the corporate board and management structures. So that could be things like what are the company's policies? What are their standards? How do they disclose information publicly? Who is their auditor and how do they disclose that? What are the compliance issues? This is a lot about transparency and operating a company in a healthy way, not just in order to maximize the profits, but also to manage some of the software things that they need to, to look at on a governance side. I read where they've developed or an ESG score uh, has evolved. And I kind of think about it being analogous to a Moody's or Standard & Poor's rating. From a consumer lending perspective, people might think about a FICO score or a Vantage score. So when you're doing deals, we talk about ESG, is that score starting to come up in discussions uh, as you look to get companies to invest in these other firms? Is it something that they're really checking that box now and really making sure that it's something that they're comfortable with? Yeah, there's definitely a strong desire in the ESG community to define a score that everyone can support. But the challenge is, it's really hard to find one score that everybody supports. Right. And so as a result, investors may have their own scorecard. Not too long ago, literally uh, in March, I went to a, a big forum, a green forum in Manhattan. And boy, there, there were probably 48 presenters but I'm going to say 12 to 15 of those presenters had an ESG scorecard that they worked very hard on and amazingly smart people, amazingly impressive ways to measure. So it's not a question of is this good thinking? It's a question of getting people to rally behind one thing and using that. And so I think this has still got, you know, we're in the early innings of, of a long play on what is that ESG score. You know, you, you mentioned, you know, Moody's and S&P's. And so, you know, those are standards already. So this is, I think, going to take some time. And I think it's really important that it is uh, discussed. We've seen what I call, you know, greenwashing. You may have heard that expression where companies kind of dress themselves in green. And then when you look behind the curtains, if you will, yeah. realize I'm not so sure this is really beneficial to the environment and the world. And so right. it, it's a really important element. And, and I hope that to see... The both, you know, from a, a corporate standpoint, as well as a regulatory and ESG community standpoint, they can rally behind something. So over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of developments in the investment banking, or I should really say the investment space. We have the Jobs Act, uh, jumpstart our business startups by President Obama, uh, crowdfunding companies like Kickstarter. And more recently, we have SAFE, which is a simple agreement for future equity. 
a lot of these are about democratization of investing, letting more and more people get involved with investing who may not be accredited investors. So when you kind of think about these different solutions that have hit the market, what's your thought on the value that they're bringing? And, and do you think that potentially certain consumers may get over their head as far as their understanding of what they're putting their money behind? I think that the, overall the trends are good, but you do have to be careful to protect the investor. And so, yeah, I agree with you. This is a little bit about the democratization of the ability to invest in companies and the large institutions and let's face it, high net worth individuals have all sorts of access to invest in whether it's early stage, middle stage, or, you know, other types of assets in the economy. You know, a lot of the, the John Q public people, you can buy a stock and that's about it. But what we're seeing here and with the advent of Kickstarter and crowdfunding, we're seeing these communities brought up where the everyday consumers can go in and analyze a business and invest small dollars. And I think it's terrific. I think it's great that people can can get access to those type of investments. We just want to make sure that the disclosures and that the people who are providing those opportunities are real. And so the SEC and FINRA do have a lot of regulations around that and have types of capital raises that require certain requirements to make sure that the investor understands fully the risks involved. And it may be in the fine print that they miss. So, you know, there, how do you make sure that's done correctly? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not the right person to ask that. But, you you know, that that probably someone's going to say, oh, I, I didn't know that. And they signed a document that said that they understood it. Right. So that's in the smaller points. But I think the bigger picture here, you know, we're just seeing more people involved in, in more opportunities. And I think what that also, the other impact is, is that we're seeing smaller businesses get the opportunity to try it out. Small entrepreneurs who up to now, did never had a way to fund an idea. Right, it, it funded, and I think we're going to see huge companies that would never have come about without the help of less institutional and more market John Q. public facing investors. Yeah, it's interesting when you take the time to really re uh, read a PPM or private placement offering, and you read the risk section, which now is eighty percent of the whole document. <laughs> you kind of walk away like, should I really be doing this? <laughs> so <laughs> anyway. Cool. Yeah. So, well, great stuff. This has been really uh, educational and informative. I always like to end, end my podcast with a personal question. I got two for you, actually. You know, when you came to Cambridge Wilkinson, you, you came with a very diverse background, including time with financial services, consumer product companies, uh, positions in marketing operations, domestic and international business experience. So when you think about people that are coming out of college and, and trying to evaluate careers that they may want to get involved with either today or, or down the road, what advice would you give someone who is thinking about investment banking as a career? And is, is it something that someone right out of college really can think about? Or do they really need to get a lot of that tribal knowledge under their belt the way you have to really be successful? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any right answer. But you know, my advice to folks who are coming out, and, and investment banking seems to be incredibly hot these days in the business schools, undergrads, as well as MBAs. And so I get approached by a lot of folks and I'm like, you got to do your homework. For me, that means getting on the phone or meeting with other investment bank professionals, all types, the big guys in the big shops, you know, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, City, as well as the smaller ones and really understand the marketplace, take internships. I've had, gee, over 25 interns work with me at Cambridge and I've been very, very lucky with the caliber of the folks. And one of my mantras is, uh, I'll help be your career coach as long as you want me. I, that's why I love giving back and having been through a lot and we all have scars to show for it is helping young people uh, along their career way, path. If you want to do that, then there's th there's other things I would say that you want to look at in terms of your skill sets, but I, it's not for everybody. You know, the, I've learned is they're just not for everybody and you want to do your homework. And there may be, you may want to get into finance, work for a company in the finance department and understand how a company puts together its financials and their projections. And that can be very, very helpful. You may want to see how a company markets itself. You know, I had the good fortune to be in marketing and sales and general management and business development. So kind of a little bit of everything. So the other question I was thinking about as we've been going through the session today is I love the show Shark Tank. I don't know if you're a big fan of it, but I would imagine watching it with you must be uh, a little distracting. You're like, oh, come on, guys. What do you, what do you mean you're giving that guy a million dollars? <laughs> It is fun to watch and you see how they negotiate and you see how both sides are giving values to their company. There's a lot of theater there and, you know, oh, absolutely entertainment value.
But at the end of it, these are people putting many, many years of their life into projects. And by bringing in one of these stars to not only provide capital, but to be part of the name brand on their business is phenomenal. And yeah, we see what these guys can do, the, the impact that these guys have in those businesses. And, yeah. and sometimes it may not be rational on what they do. And <laughs> how do they come up with that decision? But it is, is, it is entertaining. I believe that a lot of people in a lifetime will have a million dollar idea, but very, very few people will ever follow through. Yes. Right? And sometimes you sit there in Shark Tank and say, I thought about that five years ago, right? But yes. I didn't do anything about it. Well, Tom, thanks a lot. This is Rich Altman. We've been syncing up with Tom McDermott, Managing Director with investment banking firm Cambridge Wilkinson. Thank you, Tom, for joining us today. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And be sure to leave us a review. Follow us on LinkedIn and connect with us on Twitter at GDS Link. That's at G-D-S-L-I-N-K. Have a question for the show or have a specific topic you want us to cover? Hit the link in the description to drop us a note. Thank you for lending us part of your day. Make it a great one.